Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Rita, and I am the American Spaces Director at the US Embassy Ghana. I'm working together on this program with my colleagues, Andrew, the American Spaces Outreach Coordinator, and Archibald, the American Spaces Assistant. American Spaces provides access to current and reliable information about the United States through book collections, internet access, events, and activities for everyone. Normally, we would be meeting face to face either at our American Center at the US Embassy in Accra or our American Corner in North Legon. But due to the global pandemic, our spaces are temporarily closed. The good news is through virtual programming, we are able to reach beyond Accra. Would love to know where everyone is viewing us from in the comment box below. Please type where you are tuning in from. Please type for us where you are tuning in from in the comment box below. Thanks to you all for joining today's program. During the session, kindly type all your comments or questions on the topic of the day in the comment box below. Today marks the International Day of Democracy, and we are going to discuss the importance of the youth in democracy. With, we are going to do this with a well-known Yali Mandela Washington Fellow, Mr. Mutari Mumuni Mukhtar. Mukhtari Mumuni Mukhtar is the Executive Director of the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism, shortly known as WASI, a regional research organization focused on security and counter terrorism research to support state and regional counter terrorism policies. He has successfully led WASI to international prominence and relevance in preventing violent violent extremism, conflict prevention, and significantly encourage youth empowerment. In the last five years, the organization has worked to stop more than 22 radicalized youth from traveling to join terrorist groups. WASI's work includes mobilizing youth, youth groups for peace. For peace, and ensuring inclusive participation in Ghana's democratic processes. This organization has empowered more than 1,600 youth and local community members as peace ambassadors and agents of change. They have, the WASI organization has empowered over 1,600 youth and local community members as peace ambassadors and agents, agents of change. Mutari is an alumnus of YALI, Mandela Washington Fellowship 2016. We must emphasize that. A global shaper of the World Economic Forum, scholar of the Aspen Institute, and serves as a mentor for youth career and professional development. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mukhtari Mumuni Mukhtar. Please, you have the platform now, sir. Thank you, thank you very much for such very, very elaborate introduction. I'm very, very grateful for that. You are welcome, uh, you deserve it. <laughs> you are doing good thank work. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to the viewers and followers all over the world and welcome to this program, today's program on the International Day of Democracy. Uh, we at the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism, whilst building peace in our communities, we would like to highlight our work that relates to the contribution of young people, especially for democratic development and participation in Ghana's democracy. My presentation is going to be brief, but very exciting for you. And I'll invite com comments and questions from anyone 
who is following us. So the presentation will look at WASI, the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism, building peace and participatory democracy. Between peace and democracy, we're looking at the relationship between these two and the participatory democracy and what it is. We would also be looking at local governance structure that allows citizens to participate in the process. We would also look at youth and the challenges to participation. And of course, the conclusion, and would be happy to invite comments, questions, and any ideas you have in terms of contributions. Yes, building peace and ensuring democratic participation of young people is an inherent feature of governance. And we must do everything we can to ensure it is part of our programming, irrespective of our key area of engagement. And that is what WASI does. The West Africa Center for Counter Extremism was set up in 2014 as a response to the growing number of young people in West Africa who were falling for and succumbing to radicalizing ideals. And so this was set up in a year when West Africa recorded the highest number of fatalities resulting from terrorism, even ahead of ISIS. We had over 7,200 fatalities. <laughs> and this was set up to help prevent violent extremism and ensure positive participation of young people in society. So it's an independent regional organization on the drivers of radicalization and violent extremism to support state and regional counterterrorism policies. Of course, we our work seeks to support democratic participation and good governance in West Africa. And we have helped as our uh, introduction indicated to stop at least 22 individuals from engaging and traveling to join terrorist groups elsewhere. In our work, in terms of helping build the capacity of young people, we have empowered more than 1,620 young leaders and community members as peace ambassadors and community agents for development. We have helped to deepen awareness around radicalization and violent extremism in this space. Yes, of course, Ghana is not at war and we are often very, very well credited for being a peaceful and stable country. That is exactly right in terms of description. But to assume or to conclude that Ghana is entirely peaceful is to ignore the serious challenges of insecurity and violence in our space that often threaten the peace and stability of our country. And so the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism is focused on preventing radicalization and violent extremism here, building peace and ensuring conflict resolution and ensuring the values of community service and young people, volunteerism and patriotism, building the foundations for diversity and a pluralistic culture, protection of human rights and gender-based violence, gender and women's empowerment, leadership and career development of young people to be able to positively participate in the process. In our work, and all who work in this area, recognize that conflicts are often a failure of institutions to function effectively. We notice that prolonged conflicts and violence are often a manifestation of the anguish of citizens, especially young people who have lost faith in the states and the institutions of governance. Uh, rule of law has issues. I mean, there are challenges with rule of law that impact on the peace and stability of societies. We notice in our areas of engagement that most chieftaincy conflicts are often sustained because the parties involved do not believe in democratic institutions or accept court rulings. Very often we have cases in the northern part, I mean, for instance, in the Willensee and Bimbla areas, in the northern part, we have uh, you know, the Daba traditional areas and the Mampurus traditional areas where court rulings have been made and the parties involved often put this aside and engage in other means, often violent means of confrontation. If people believe in democratic systems, and decisions that come out of democratic institutions, they would respect decisions, they will respect court rulings, they will respect 
peaceful means of conflict resolution. And this is a key area of concern. And so we work to build strong values of democratic processes in young people. So we're looking at the relationship between peace and democratic governance. What is the relationship between democracy or democratic participation and peace? These two are interdependent on each other. They are inseparable. And we often say that there is a symbiotic relationship between peace and democratic governance. You know, peace is sustained on the governance, the quality of governance you have in place. And governance is preserved by sustainable peace. And so there is no any, you cannot decouple these two. These two are interdependent. And so they cannot be peace without good or proper democratic governance. And they cannot be sustained democratic governance without sustainable peace. These two are interdependent and we need to emphasize both in our areas of engagement. Young people, as we know, are leading actors when it comes to vigilante violence in our country. And we know that the vigilante violence is incompatible with democratic governance. And so it is our call, our duty to ensure that we do everything to uproot vigilante, the future of vigilante violence in our politics. The sustenance of our democracy is dependent on the youth and the youth participation, positive participation is key to sustaining our democracy. There cannot be a guarantee of our democracy without the positive involvement of the youth. And all we do, we ensure we build the values of inclusivity, inclusive engagement with civil society and ensuring that these values you know, are promoted, are deepened and incorporated in our lives. Citizenship, you know, building peace ensures, you know, involves ensuring democratic governance, which has the involvement of the youth. And citizenship participation or citizen participation enhances the quality of decisions that come out of those engagement. Participation creates a sense of ownership and legitimacy of governments. When pe people participate in the process, the decisions that come out of it, they are more likely to embrace it, to support it, and to ensure that it comes to fruition. The Local Governance Act 936 of 2016 is what provides the framework for effective local governance. It is what gives and provides the template and the foundation for the engagement, the mode of engagement of young people and the process of democratic governance. And pro, I mean, this act promotes citizenship participation, citizen participation in the process. It helps to reduce apathy in the process of governance. There is often, you know, the challenge of apathy in the process of governance. People complain all the time. When decisions are made, they do not often get the needed consultation, the needed involvement of people, especially young people, in the process because of the apathy people have towards institutions. And this act helps reduce that. It promotes citizenship and a sense of patriotism. When people are involved in the process, they are more likely to develop you know, that sense of support and a sense of patriotism as part of society. It guarantees a stake and local ownership in the governance process. It also promotes, of course, information sharing and accountability. When young people participate in the process, they are more likely to ask questions, they are more likely to be critical, and this borders on accountability. They are more likely to probe questions that relates to management of our resources, and this relates to you know, a check on corruption and good governance. And so it's important that young people participate in the process. We know that projects often stand a better chance of success if young people or people are involved in the process. And we do this on different levels in terms of engagement. We want to ensure that young people are involved and all sectors of society feel part of the process. So we have a tiered process of engagement with society. So looking at consultations, 
We're looking at stakeholder engagement, information sharing, and forums, as well as empowerment programs. This collectively ensures an inclusive approach to engagement to ensure that quality decisions are made in the process. So we engage at a national level in terms of stakeholder engagement to get their views, their contributions, and critique relating to what the issues at hand. Beyond the national level, we're looking at key and critical institutions, like the, the institution of parliament, which has a huge and big oversight responsibility over other institutions of government. This is an important and inseparable feature of our democratic culture and, and anywhere in the world. So the par parliament plays a key role in the democratic process. And so we engage at that level to ensure that quality decisions are made, to ensure there's adequate goodwill and support for the programs we organize. We go further down at the municipal and district assembly levels to engage with the leadership at that level. We're meeting with district chief executives and municipal chief executives to understand the progress and the stages of engagement at that level and to determine the gaps involved so we can fill in those gaps depending on the issues that we work on. Beyond the uh, elected officials of state institutions, we deal with traditional leadership. Traditional leadership command a strong support and wider support in the local community. So you cannot uh, have successful programs without the involvement of traditional leaders. And so we consult with traditional leaders for their views and their support as well. We go further down to you know, the grassroots in dealing with young people at the grassroots to share information with them, to listen to their views and take their contributions. And collectively that helps in making quality decisions and improving our programs, especially subsequent programs we organize around you know, those issues we're dealing with. We also embrace, I mean, engage different segments of our society in terms of information sharing. Information sharing sometimes do not, I mean, it doesn't happen exclusively as information sharing. It could be embedded as part of programs that you organize. So for instance, this image shows um, an image that related to capacity building workshop around preventing violent extremism in Northern Ghana. And so as part of that, we share information for all, I mean, the entire audience to benefit from that. And information sharing helps in terms of education, in terms of ownership, and in terms of support and legitimacy of programs. When things happen in the space, we look at what critical issues, I mean, at the time, and organize forums around that. And forums allow broader engagement and quality debate that enhances the quality of decisions. And then again, of course, it's the, it, it brings about support and goodwill for programs. The forums enhance the debate and the quality of decisions you make around the programs. We also um, engage in empowerment programs. We identify what areas of capacity, what areas of skills and capabilities would be critical for young people to participate in society. What I mean by participate in society, it can be participate in terms of engaging in community work, volunteerism, in you know, professional careers. You can look for jobs if you have a good understanding, you know, for instance, if you have training, training relating to, you know, um, say youth activism, community service, service and community development on your own this could be adequate enough to start engaging at the community level. People lack basic skills, even in terms of CV writing, in terms of even interviews. How do, we even, how do you even get a job if you cannot write a proper CV or if you're not able to, I mean, have a good and successful interview? So these are critical areas that often are overlooked. And so we engage young people, empower them to be able to participate you know, positively in society. The empowerment programs also border on very important democratic principles and good governance relating to gender inclusiveness 
and active citizenship participation. And so we make it a deliberate part of our engagement to ensure inclusive you know, program where we have women and girls involved, we have people with disabilities involved. This program uh, on the right hand side is a section of the audience who had hearing impairment. And so we sought the services of a language interpreter to be able to interpret to these people to also participate and actively get involved in the process. And so it's a deliberate you know, part of our programming. And this is a key and important element in deepening democracy. If you are unable to get these people to participate in the process, of course, you're not doing good to society. And they are all important elements of our society and we need to rope in all shades of society in the process. We engage I mean, through the media because the media has a bigger and larger, I mean, larger appeal. The media allows you to reach a wider audience and to be able to communicate with people of, of different backgrounds. And for a fact, the media in many ways has been very, very critical to the dissemination of information and to the programs and its success. So for instance, in 2016, uh, a young guy, who had been radicalized by ISIS, by you know, ISIS at the time, he listened to one of our programs on national television. There was a national television program called ICRA, and he listened to the program. We had a two-week program on countering violent extremism and radicalization in our local communities. And this guy listened to the program, and it appeared we were speaking directly to his situation, and that was what made the difference. So this program helped stop this young guy from traveling to join terrorist groups elsewhere. So the media is an important element of our programs. I would like to conclude at this point, like I said earlier, it's going to be a very brief presentation and I'll be very happy to listen to your questions, to your views and contributions to this. Uh, we make a conclusion that the peace and democratic governance are interdependent and they are preconditions for sustainable national development. Citizen engagement deepens the democratic process and the role of young people are key to sustaining democracy. Without an engaged youth, our democracy is in danger. The succeeding generations of young people in our space, if they are not capable, they are not empowered enough to believe in democracy and institutions of governance. The nation stands you know, a greater chance of failure when it comes to democratic consolidation. And so it's important to emphasize the role of young people and their engagement in the democratic process. So democracy is you know, unsustainable without young people involvement in it. Active involvement of citizens is necessary to consolidate governance. And this is where I would stop and would like to listen to your views, your comments and questions. Thank you very much. I think you're... Thank you, you're Mr. Muta. All right. Thank you, Mr. Muta. Thank you for your time and for giving us this significant insight into your organization's work. Um, it's that. really important. Yes, it's really important. You have really shed light on it for us to know that it's important for the youth to participate in a country's democracy. You have shed so much light on the importance of the youth in Ghana, especially to be involved in the democratic process. And as we, we commemorate today, we are so thankful for this insight today, especially the International Day of Democracy. We are so thankful for the great information that you have given to us this afternoon. Uh, one of our viewers want to know, how can the youth be encouraged to actively participate in the country's democratic process? How can they thank be- Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, yes. so there is no better time than now in our history for young people's engagement, active engagement in the democratic process. Uh, in the past, we never had tools like uh, social media. Mm -hmm. People are using social media for all kinds of causes. 
very, very powerful courses. People have launched important careers out of social media. And young people can use social media as an important and effective tool to engage in the process, to contribute to discussions and conversations around democracy. And the school environment, join a club today. Join a club that focuses on democracy and the values of democracy. If you join clubs, it enables you to contribute to the process. If there's no club in your school, form one. You can form a club and get your colleagues and community members to join that. There's different levels of engagement. You can participate in radio conversations. You can participate on online conversations. You can participate in phase one, two, and Facebook through WhatsApp groups. You can participate through other social media platforms. And this way, it helps you be an active and responsible citizen. But sometimes people do not often you know, they undermine their efforts and the impact of these levels of engagement. Okay. There was a program we organized in the northeast of Ghana, you know, and I'm going a bit off that. Uh, in the northern, I mean, the northern part, northeast, uh, Cherokee need to be specific. And so um, there was a case where a disabled person came forward to talk about his experience and being part of the assembly. You know, a lot of young people, a lot of people, especially um, vulnerable individuals, often do not get the support they need at the community level. And so they feel a strong sense of apathy in terms of getting involved. So when he got involved at the district assembly, he was a, you know, a presiding member. He got involved in this. And of, within a short period, he began to see the importance of his involvement. The assembly were able to incorporate his views and budget. They were able to provide a budget for programs relating to people with disabilities. He himself was, you know, an electronics uh, repairer. He, I mean, he repairs my mobile phones and other electronic stuff. He, he was given a loan to expand his business. And that allowed other people to find reason to engage. And so it's important to get involved, no matter the level of engagement it is. This can open up huge opportunities and can make a huge difference. Wow, thank you so much. You're doing great work. I think our viewers will agree with me that your work on terrorism is, is great. It's awesome. Thank you so much. And I, you. during thank the you. session, you did mention, yes, I, I particularly noted that one that you did mention about the 22 guys that were recruited to join terrorist yeah. group but thankfully you were able to stop that process and we are grateful for that we are grateful for that but the Thank question you. coming now it's based on that can you please point us to some signs exhibited by agencies or individuals who recruit for terrorist groups this is a viewer wants to know if you can point us to some signs that are exhibited by agencies or individuals who recruit for these terrorist groups. There are very broad and different areas, I mean, ways in which people lure innocent people into terrorism. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some of these are geography specific or context specific, depending on the issues in your environment. So one of the very obvious and popular means, it's through, I mean, job situations, job opportunities. So for okay. instance, a young guy um, who got in touch with a potential recruit um, talked about his situation, his unemployed situation, he's looking for a job. And so over time, he finds a way to lure him with very, very good job opportunity mm -hmm. somewhere in you know, North Africa. And so it's very easy for you to fall for that. And we'll have several, several people who have fallen into this. They never understand, they never know until they get involved. Oh, okay. When it is too late, when it's too late, you know, to turn back. They actually mm. would mask this in the form of a job opportunity. And so okay. you go through all the normal and legitimate processes of getting involved in, I mean, getting a job opportunity your travel documents, documentation, immigration documentation, everything well sorted out. And then you end up realizing that you are in a big mess. 
that happens. And then people also watch, you know, their victims. They profile their victims. There's something we call recce. A reconnaissance allows this potential recruit to be able to prey on their victim. So they look at your vulnerabilities and can't directly recruit you through a process of radicalization. So oh. if, if, if someone has very uncompromising and negative religious ideals, a potential recruiter can help in escalating the person's commitment to violence. Oh, yeah. And so he would urge you on in conversations, make you, I mean, help amplify your views and your ideals around that. And so it, that is a very complex process. And it's often very difficult for the victim to realize because he's already primed to think along those lines. And that happens very, very often. Uh, we have other people too who in the local community, there's a way they can get, get you involved in terms of prey on your group, local grievances. Local okay. grievances can ele elevate people's commitment to uh, radicalization and terrorism. And so recruits often come in the form of helping you in the form of identifying with that cause, but they often exhibit an extreme version of the grievances. So they often serve as an agent to escalate those grievances. And through that, they have that clever way of recruiting you into those uh, I mean, terrorist cells. And so there are very, very broad ways through which, I mean, people get involved in this and the recruits do that. So when you find somebody, um, so for instance, we are inevitably talking about religious radicalization when we talk about terrorism, even though it is not exclusively religiously inspired. Terrorism generally is not religiously inspired, but post-September 11 terrorism seem to disproportionately focus on the religious nature of it. And so we also talk about that as well. And so you find a preacher, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. creating mm -hmm. what we call narratives. Mm -hmm. narratives that are supportive of violence. So narratives, for, for instance, that the West is against Islam. And so they go further to deepen those narratives in the minds of vulnerable individuals. Those mm -hmm. people are seeking to radicalize people to a point where they can safely recruit them to join terrorist groups. And so in our work, we, we develop what we call counter narratives, narratives that seek to reverse those ideals that lead individuals to become radicalized. So you look at the context of religion. If, people, if narratives are driven, I mean, cut from the religious context, I mean, religious books, you also have to look at from religious sources to counter those views. So we have narratives that seek to reverse those ideals. So religious leaders use those narratives. So you need to be watchful or watch out for those kinds of things from religious uh, leaders. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, that's encouraging. That's encouraging. Thank you for that great insight and for the pointers. There are great pointers. You know, um, a youth unemployment, youth unemployment, that is a major yeah. cause. And then I think yes. you mentioned the vulnerability to religious yeah. views of other people. Religious view of people can also be used. That's a means for recruiting somebody. Thank you so much for that great insight. It's awesome to know all this. Thank you so much. I appreciate and there's I appreciate another that. question. There's another question for a viewer for you. The viewer okay. wants to know if there are vigilante groups in Ghana. I think there's of course, another. There vigilante. That one. <laughs> of course, there are vigilante groups in Ghana. Uh, I mean, it's very well well documented, uh, and. These two major political parties, the NDC and the MPP, both have groups, young people who organize themselves, you know, to engage in violence and intimidation of their opponents in support of their political leaders and political actors. And it's very, very pervasive in spite of the fact that in recent times we have spoken seriously against it at the national level, at the community level, people engage in all kinds of programming against it, but it's still very pervasive. We have vigilant, I mean, invisible forces. We have um, Azoka boys, we have uh, Kandahar boys, we have 64 <laughs> so I mean, at least they are very well known 21 
you know, groups that are safely described as vigilante groups. So yes, we have them. Yeah. Right. Oh, great. 21, you, did you say 21? More than that, yes. 20, oh, I 21. see. Yeah. Okay, so for a follow-up question, are there, he, the person wants to know what is your organization doing to eradicate or minimize the presence of these vigilante groups or their effects in society? So we, in the, I mean, if you were following in this space, you would remember when Captain Mahama was lynched about three years ago in May, we organized one of the first major national forums on vigilante violence, the challenge of vigilante violence mm -hmm. in Ghana yeah. in our political space. Mm -hmm. And this involved the National Peace Council. So we had the chairman of the National Peace Council as a chair for that particular program. We had Dr. Uh, now Professor uh, Kwesenin of Kofi Annan Center. We have people, I mean, Imani Ghana uh, speaking at the event. We had the former Minister mm -hmm. for Gender. We have the current Deputy Minister for Interior who came to speak on behalf of the Minister. So we had all the key actors in security and civil society involved at the time. This was our uh, key and primary major event against vigilante violence in, in our country. Beyond that, in our office here, we organize uh, weekly weekend programs. Uh, people who identify what the work we do, they come in here for us to hold our forums against vigilante violence. We've had that at least six of them in the last five years. We have incorporated in all the programs we do in all capacity building workshops we organize, we incorporate the feature of vigilante violence in our political space. And this falls under civic engagement and citizenship. And so when people uh, see themselves as positive citizens, they are less likely to engage in violence. When people feel empowered to fend for themselves, they are less likely to engage in violence mm -hmm. in support of political actors. So these are very, I mean, very broad ways we can look at it. And this is how we've been doing it. This is how we've been looking at it in terms of the programs we organize. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for that great answer. Your, and and, your... and, and it, it's, 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 it's a really, really very serious and dangerous phenomenon here. And we often talk about it in ways that do not, we don't see movement in terms of mm -hmm. action against it. Because we have now a legislation against vigilante violence. We have the National Peace Council engage in efforts, you know, together with the major political parties to disband them. We have mm -hmm. a, a short commission report presented to government to ensure that we act, I mean, we eliminate the vigilante groups in our political space. And as I speak now, we have very, very little progress and success in this area. And we just saw in the recent registration exercise, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, I mean, the feature of vigilante violence in ways that nobody would have thought, I mean, it could happen after all these happens. major processes mm -hmm. yeah, that have been initiated. And it's, so it's a very big thing. And yeah. So all the programs the we do, closed. we incorporate that. The mm -hmm. election is closed and there's no indication that we will not have vigilante violence in these elections. And so we need to work, I mean, to watch out. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that great contribution, awesome. And then You're the welcome. advice as well. The advice as well, I believe that our viewers are listening carefully to it and we are all going to play our part to ensure a, de a peaceful democratic process. Uh, that's a question for you, another question for you. What would okay. be your response to the youth who show apathy to the democratic process, who show apathy to democracy, particularly when the feeling is that the system seems to kind of have failed them? What, what, what would you say? To what would be your response to this category of well, youth? My, my, my answer to the youth is that <laughs> they have a stake in the democratic process. In mm -hmm. fact, the democracy, the structure we have here now, it's in their name. The future of our democracy is the youth of our country. And it's mm -hmm. important that the youth participate in the process. Of course, there are several challenges, apart from the apathy, and there are reasons for the apathy. 
the loss of trust and confidence in political actors and institutions. Mm -hmm. The truth is, governments all over the world have let their people down. And so people are looking for new sort of new set of leadership and ideas to transform their societies. As we speak now, there are more than six, actually seven major political events, protests, mm -hmm. demonstrations all over the world against established governments. And this is, a, I mean, a product of the anguish and frustrations of society against established leadership. And it's important that young people get involved, irrespective of the challenges involved, to participate in the process. And this is how we can reclaim leadership from the wrong hands. We know that there are many parts of the world where younger people are in office. They are in charge of affairs and they are doing a fantastic job. These are indications that young people can contribute and can lead successfully if given the chance. And I mean, mind you, this is power and power has its own dynamics and I mean, uh, challenges. Power has its own characters, characteristics. You, they would not allow you to have it easily. People are looking to protect the power. And so young people would have a challenging time to participate or to get involved. But in spite of that, we need young people to participate and you don't have to just get involved at the national level. You can begin anywhere. You can be, begin in your local community. You can begin at the school level. You can begin on cyberspace, the social, I mean, media. And this way, it would give you, you know, a stronger foot in the process of leadership in our space. And sometimes you don't necessarily need to lead. Sometimes people think that in getting involved is about leading. You don't necessarily need to lead. You can be a critic a positive and strong critique that can be impactful in changing and or making the reforms that we're looking for. Oh, thank you. Awesome, wonderful. <laughs> thank you. I, I really hope that the youth are listening to it. We have to be the change we're looking for. Thank you for that. Thank you for that advice. You're Great, welcome. awesome answer. Our next question is from one of our listeners and he is asking how relevant is youth empowerment to the democratic process of the country? How relevant youth is youth empowerment to the democratic process of the country? Youth empowerment is so critical that okay. without it, we would have almost a failed uh, system. Because an empowered youth, empowered youth is an enabled youth, is a mm -hmm. capable youth. So when you are empowered, it gives you extra energy and ideas to mm -hmm. get involved. And so we, we cannot compromise on that in terms of getting young people empowered. So when you're looking to participate in the process, what are you looking to do? What, what, what are you bringing to the table? What are you looking to do? It's not just about talking about your ideas, but what are you looking to do in terms of action? You know, you need young people to be empowered in terms of the actionable things that could be done. Can you write a proposal that relates to building a clinic or a dilapidated, a dilapidated building, I mean, school in your community? Can you write a proper proposal with a proper budget involved to ensure that it attracts the support of anybody to support that? Can you get involved in educating people about, you know, cholera in your community? in ways that it is sustainable. These are things that you need to look at in terms of, I mean, empowering young people to engage and get involved positively. So there's no, you, we cannot compromise on youth empowerment. It's important and it's necessary. Thank you so much. On this day of international, um, International Day of Democracy. It's important for us to hear all these. And I believe that our viewers who are mostly youth are listening to you. They are listening to you and they would see the relevance, the importance of their participation in the democratic process. We thank you for these great answers. We thank you. The questions are still coming in. So you're going to be having more questions. <laughs> Interesting. But maybe before that, I, I, I like to make a point, if okay. you allow me. Oh, that's so, okay. You um, can go ahead. <laughs> okay. So there was a point about the challenges of youth participation. Yes. The youth and the challenges of participation. Yeah, and I think true. someone asked a question earlier about it. And uh, yes. I was meant to emphasize that. 
We know mm -hmm. that there are challenges to youth participation in the process. There are many people who are looking to get involved, but they mm -hmm. feel that the system does not allow them to yes. easily participate in the process. And I mentioned earlier that different levels of engagement at the community level, at the school level, through social media and social media platforms. But also at the national level, in terms of direct politics, the direct political participation, um, we know there are challenges. So for instance, we have very, very expensive and high cost of political campaigns in Ghana. And so if you want to get involved in an elected office, you have a huge task of mobilizing financial resources to do that. The youth does not have that. And so it's a huge challenge. We have, right now we just had um, an announcement by the Electoral Commission pegging presidential you know, nomination filing. 200,000 Ghana cities. This is 1 billion cities, all Ghana cities. This is not a small amount of money. And you know, and we are talking a lot about reducing the, the requirement, the age, the requirement age to contest in terms of presidency. If we reduce that to 35 years, we see Nigeria do that in the last couple of years. Nigeria has succeeded in reducing uh, the, you know, your, the age for contesting for presidents. At that age, if it happens in Ghana, as a young person, it's going to be a huge task to be able to get involved. And so you need to do something extraordinary to be able to win the support in a support to be able to get involved in, in politics, especially elected office. So these are challenges we are confronted with, and we need to still talk about it, debate it, and find ways to overcome it. And is your organization doing something about this challenge? I, I believe your so organization. We talk a lot. I mean, yes. when we get a chance. So we talk about it at the, I mean, through our stakeholder engagement, uh, you know, especially the age and also the high cost of the election campaigns. And this is a very, very critical example of for political engagement. There are so many good young people with good ideas, but the financial requirements to get involved, it's a big, big, you know, obstacle for them. And so we continue to talk about it and uh, finding ways and hoping that, you know, leadership can look at it. Okay. Okay. That's, that's great. That's great. Thank you so much for that answer. And I believe that during the stakeholder meetings, you will do well to invite the youth. They will be represented at the stakeholder meeting as well. I think your internet is, is a bit cracky, but I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Okay. It's better now. Right. It's better. All right. Okay, all thank, right. You. All right. thank you. So that my next question is also coming from another viewer who wants to know, what can be done to enshrine democratic tenants among the youth? You know, today is uh, International Day of Democracy, and they want to know what can be done to enshrine democratic tenants among the youth in the society. What can be done? We need to deepen the sustenance of our democracy by deepening the values of our democracy, democratic tenets. We're looking at the rule of law and good governance. We're looking at the preservation of the fundamental human rights, you know, working against gender-based violence and ensuring anti-corruption and strong, strong institutions against corruption. And this, these are things that are often reserved for the older generations of our society. Young people often are not deliberately drawn into these areas and how to build and sustain these values. So at the school level, uh, I mean, when I was in senior high school, there were groups such as the Human Rights Club. The human okay. Rights Clubs were meant to deepen the values of human rights okay. and other values related to the sustenance of democracy and human rights. We have peace clubs in schools. The peace clubs also work around these areas ensuring you know, peace and stability of our societies, ensuring peaceful resolutions to conflicts, ensuring that we support you know, institutions for I mean, amicable solution, I mean, resolution of disputes. 
we need to engage and go back to, I mean, those systems, those systems at the school level. And this goes beyond senior high school to universities and other tertiary institutions. These are ways we need to uh, get involved. Of course, the National Commission for Civic Education has the primary legal mandate to enshrine those values, to deepen those values in our society, especially among young people. Uh, I've seen the last couple of years, uh, a, I mean, an, a reawakened in you know, our spirit of the National Commission for Civic Education. And I think they are doing much more now than uh, previously uh, we I mean, we, we, we were seeing. And we're hoping that with more resources, we will continue to deepen that sort of education, especially in schools and the local communities to be able to sustain you know, our democracy. Because its sustenance depends and on young people believing in these values and be able to practicalize it. Thank you. Another awesome answer. And uh, today, the youth are really benefiting from your great work and your great responses. We are so grateful for these wonderful responses to their questions. The questions are still coming in. They are still flowing in. And our okay. next question <laughs> is from another viewer who wants to know what in your estimation, what in your estimation are some reforms that ought to be made to ensure active youth participation in Ghana's democratic process? Ghana's democratic process, what? <laughs> so every society, the quality of every society depends on the youth of that society. Mm -hmm. We have to be very intentional about the way we develop leadership in Ghana. Mm -hmm. When I say we have to be intentional, it means that we have to have deliberate programs at the grassroots level through our educational system and building systems and structures that allows people, young people, to see themselves participating actively in the democratic process. In the last couple of years, I have seen the creation of youth parliaments, especially in the northern parts of Ghana. Youth mm -hmm. parliaments that are created with youth, I mean, and civil society initiatives that allows young people to model a sort of parliament at the district level, at the regional levels, and conduct their activities as though they were established parliaments seeking oversight over issues in the local community. Youth mm. parliaments that engage in the work of you know, leaders in the local community. These are very positive ways uh, to get involved. And then, like I mentioned earlier, at the school level, you need to get involved. That's very important. We need to have people get involved in these activities. And mm -hmm. over time, throughout the school process, the lifestyle, like your lifestyle cycle through educational system, you'll be able to, you know, build these ideals and build this, you know, you know, the capacity to get involved in terms of building a stable democracy. So I encourage young people to get involved at the various, you know, organizations and youth initiatives in the local community. You know, many of these, them, you know, are, I mean, are less recognized than they really exist in the local community. There are so many youth initiatives now in the local community that need, you know, prominence in terms of the, the work they do. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, these are uh, great suggestions, great, great suggestions. That these reforms that you have suggested, I don't know whether you've tabled it anywhere, but they are great suggestions. And um, I hope with this special reference to the one at the educational institution level, I think it's, it's a great suggestion. And I hope that your organization will be able to pursue it, to pursue it. They are very great suggestions. Once sure. again, I, I, yes, once again, I want to say a very big thank you to Mr. Mucha. <laughs> for your time Thank you. and Thank you for much. giving us this significant insight into your organization's work on the importance of the youth in Ghana's democracy as we commemorate the International Day of Democracy. Great information we have had today, listeners, viewers. I, I trust you realize it's great information that we've received from Mr. Buta. Thank you for your good work. And thank you all for 
joining today's program. Mr. Muta, uh, do you want to say a uh, final, do you want to give us your final comments before uh, we round up the program? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you to the viewers and the followers for today's program. I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to share what we have been doing here in the last five years. And of course, to the American Embassy for the support they have rendered in terms of supporting our programs, especially the Preventing Violent Extremism Program in Northern Ghana. It has been very, very effective and impactful in the lives of many young people in the Northern part and uh, as well as in the Southern part of the country. So we are very, very grateful for that. And to all young people listening, there's no better time than now to get involved in the affairs of your country and your communities. You have more capabilities than you imagine. And so to determine that you need to get involved. So it's important that we all get involved in the process of deepening our democracy, in the process of deepening good governance, and the process of deepening you know, a good and positive democratic culture. And what's the peace network? It's a network of young people who believe in the ideals of peace. And we use that platform to deepen the ideas we talk about, democratic participation, good governance, conflict resolution, peace building, and preventing violent extremism. If you are interested in being a member of the Peace Network, you can con I mean, contact me after this program and we'll make you a part of this. We have uh, social media platforms that allows us to occasionally discuss important issues that come up on, in our country. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, too. Thank you, too. Before ending today's program, I would like to tell you about an online resource that you may find helpful, eLibrary USA. The eLibrary USA is a state-of-the-art digital library with nine premier electronic databases that includes digital newspapers, magazines, journals, videos, and dissertations. Usually, this resource is only available to use in person at our American spaces, but with a global pandemic resulting in the closing of our American spaces, we are opening access to this amazing resource to the public. If you are interested, please sign up using the link that can be found in the comment box below. If you are interested, please sign up using the link provided in the comment box below. It actually takes less than two seconds to do the registration. That's the request form. You fill it in less than two minutes and then you are done and you would receive and log in details. Your details will be sent to you to be able to enter the database, to be able to enter the database. And that concludes our program today. The next virtual program is on September 17th. Please follow us on Facebook for more amazing virtual programming. Thank you all for joining us today. It's been wonderful having you. Until next time, Please stay safe, observe all personal hygiene protocols, practice social distancing, and wear a mask in public, and wear a mask in public. Thank you all. Thank you.